I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's December 7th, and we have a lot to talk about. When it comes to managing MS and improving your quality of life, I think it's important to remember that managing MS doesn't only mean getting on a disease-modifying therapy. I think of DMTs as the foundation of your MS management plan, and I always try to remind people that the real value of being on a disease-modifying therapy is not about managing your MS symptoms. It's about delaying progression, or as I prefer to see it, it's about extending your quality of life preventing those symptoms from multiplying or getting worse. So just like so many MS symptoms are invisible, the real benefit of being on an effective DMT is equally invisible, but still incredibly important. But your MS management plan should include more because evidence shows that there are other things that you can do. Things that don't require a pill, injection, or transfusion but are still going to improve your overall well-being. Things like quitting smoking, getting exercise, making smart food choices. These are all things that will improve your physical health as well as your quality of life. And when we're talking about improving your quality of life, I hope, when necessary, that you'll add one more thing to the list, and that's assistive technology. These are tech-based tools that can offset physical disabilities and allow you to stay more fully and independently engaged in your life. Examples of assistive technology can be as simple as having your Amazon Alexa device turn out the lights or change the channel on your TV. And they can be as complex as using robotic assistance to transfer from your bed to your wheelchair. Joining me today to talk about how assistive technology can be a game-changer for people living with MS are two experts in the field, Alex Burnham and Bill Binko. Alex is a speech-language pathologist at the Boston Home, and he's been providing care for residents and outpatients with advanced progressive neurological diseases, primarily MS, since 2009. Alex has served as Director of Rehabilitation Services since 2013, and he also oversees the Boston Home Institute for MS Education, Research, and Clinical Collaboration. Bill is a founder of ATMakers.org, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to bridge the gap between the incredible abilities of those in the high-tech and maker communities with the profound needs of assistive technology users. Today, AT Makers has teams of professional engineers, individual makers, and even high school robotics teams throughout the United States and Canada, designing and building custom assistive technology devices that they provide to end users at little or no cost. This is amazing work that produces remarkable outcomes for people. But before we get to my conversation with Alex Burnham and Bill Binko, there are a few other things that you should know about. It seems as though, like it or not, the holiday season is bringing with it a new COVID variant. And while experts are still learning about this variant, it appears to be extremely easy to transmit. That means that being fully vaccinated, including receiving a booster, is more important today than it was even a week ago. If you're currently on a disease-modifying therapy, there's detailed information in the guidance that you'll find on the National MS Society's website about any considerations you might have to make when it comes to timing your DMT with your vaccination or your vaccination booster, and you'll find a link to that guidance in today's show notes. Now, to those of you thinking, thanks, John, but we got the message— I guess I want you to understand that the reason I continue talking about this is because not everyone has gotten the message. People living with MS aren't different from other people who are basing their decision about being vaccinated on bad information, no information, or confusing information. 
And that point was really driven home to me when I reviewed the results of a nationwide survey of people living with autoimmune diseases, including MS, that was published by the Alliance for Patient Access. The survey results underscore the fact that many people living with autoimmune diseases are still confused about where to turn for reliable information and what to do about protecting themselves. And as long as that confusion exists, I think it's necessary and important to keep reminding folks who might be listening to this podcast that the COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved for use in the United States have been proven by scientific evidence to be safe for people living with MS. And the place to turn for reliable, evidence-based guidance on the COVID-19 vaccines for people living with MS is the National MS Society. So I'll apologize for seemingly repeating myself. But it's also been shown that people living with MS and other comorbidities, older people who are living with MS, People living with more significant disabilities, well, they don't do well if they contract COVID-19. But after more than three quarters of a million Americans have lost their lives to this virus, I'd hate to see even one more family lose someone because they still didn't know what to do, how to make a decision that was in their own best interest. Please make sure you're vaccinated. Make sure you've received a booster. And continue wearing that mask when you're out and about. As author Flannery O'Connor wrote back in the 1950s, the life you save may be your own. If you've already downloaded the Real Talk MS app for your Android or iOS smartphone or tablet, you'll find that report on the nationwide survey conducted by the Alliance for Patient Access under the Bonus Content tab. If you ask someone living with progressive MS what they need, I think the answer you'll hear most often is more. More treatments, more research, more progress. And last week, the International Progressive MS Alliance delivered a plan designed to achieve those things when it published a paper proposing a global research strategy to prioritize and coordinate the efforts needed to find more and better treatments and improve the quality of life for people living with progressive MS. The paper is titled, Charting a Global Research Strategy for Progressive MS and International Progressive MS Alliance Proposal. And the publication of this paper is an important step toward engaging global stakeholders in a coordinated approach to overcoming the significant challenges in this work. This coordinated approach to delivering more to the people living with progressive MS, the people who need it the most, means we can move faster and reach the finish line sooner. Full disclosure, as a member of the Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, I'm named as a co-author of this paper, and we'll be taking a closer look at what's being proposed in this paper right after the first of the year. Oh, and while we're on the subject of full disclosure... I should also mention that the publication of this paper coincides with the end of my six-year term as a member of the Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. As I've shared with you before, this has been some of the most personally rewarding work that I've ever done. And I'm taking with me six years of remarkable memories and experiences. And while those memories and experiences may be in the past, I'm also taking with me the relationships, the friendships, forged with so many remarkable men and women that I've met along the way. As some of you already know, the idea for doing this podcast came about because of my work on the Scientific Steering Committee. And here we are, 223 episodes later, and there's still lots more to talk about. And that means that although I'm no longer a member of the Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, You'll still be hearing about the cutting-edge research that the Alliance is funding and the breakthroughs that I'm confident will be achieved as the Alliance continues its work. But it's been an amazing experience for me, and I couldn't even begin to process that experience without first sharing it with you. As I mentioned a minute ago, we'll be circling back to the paper that the Progressive MS Alliance just published, and we'll be talking about it with a special guest right after the first of the year. But if you'd like to get a head start and review that paper, you'll find that link in today's show notes. (music) 
In many neurology practices, the standard of care is to take someone living with MS off disease-modifying therapies once that person is in their 60s. Although there are no guidelines regarding discontinuation of therapy for people living with MS, the rationale is that it's safe to take older people off their DMT due to lack of efficacy as patients age, and the neurologist may not want to subject their older, stable patients to the risk of the side effects that are associated with disease-modifying therapies. But the results of a study conducted by the New York State Multiple Sclerosis Consortium may challenge that sort of thinking. The New York study followed 216 people living with MS, with an average age of 50 at the beginning of the study. All of these study participants had discontinued their disease-modifying therapy, and they were monitored for an average of 4.6 years. And of these 216 study participants, 53 previously stable patients, and that's a third of the group being followed, they experienced disability worsening and disease progression after they discontinued their medication. This happened among people living with relapsing remitting MS, as well as people diagnosed with secondary progressive MS. And while the average age of the study participants was 50, the study actually included people of all ages who had discontinued their disease-modifying therapy, and this worsening and progression was seen across all age groups. People as young as 21 and as old as 82 experienced disease progression once they discontinued their DMT. So, if you were looking for one more reason to stay on your disease-modifying therapy, I think you just found it. But the reality underscoring the results of this survey is that, like all Americans, people with MS are living longer than they used to. And as the MS population ages, neurologists may have to reconsider their standard of care. And while this study looked at 216 people living with MS, a much larger comparison trial called DISCO-MS, or Discontinuation of Disease-Modifying Therapies in Multiple Sclerosis, is underway. So we can expect to hear much more about this important subject. Now, if you'd like to review the results of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. As we were just discussing, poor adherence or discontinuation of disease-modifying therapies leads to worse clinical outcomes and higher rates of relapse and disease progression. And it's always been assumed that oral disease-modifying therapies improve adherence because they're more convenient than injectable treatments. But back in August of 2020, we shared results of a study based on reported real-world use that showed about 20%, or 1 in 5 people living with MS, fail to adhere to oral DMTs, and about 1 in 4 actually stop their oral disease-modifying therapy within one year. Now, if we extend the scenario created by poor adherence or discontinuation of DMTs, it follows that those higher rates of relapse and progression are going to require a greater use of medical resources. In other words, deciding to discontinue disease-modifying therapy ultimately becomes a very expensive, resource-depleting decision. So there's a real need to better understand how patterns of adherence impact a person's MS disease course and eventually their care. That's why the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality has awarded a $100,000 grant to Dr. Rajender Aparasu a professor of pharmaceutical health outcomes at Houston's College of Pharmacy, to study adherence to three oral MS disease-modifying therapies, Jelenia, Obagio, and Tecfidera. Now, Dr. Aparasu believes that the current methods used to measure treatment adherence fall short because they don't account for changes in adherence over time. To overcome that deficiency, he plans to use a specific method of statistical analysis called group-based trajectory modeling to track changes in adherence based upon someone's prescription-filling pattern over time, and then show the relationship between that pattern 
and the status of their MS to determine whether they've experienced a relapse that required a visit to their doctor or hospitalization or a corticosteroid prescription. We'll circle back to this study once Dr. Aparasu publishes the results. And if you'd like to review the real-world adherence study results that we reported in August of 2020, you'll find that link in today's show notes. It was initially thought that cognitive dysfunction only affected people diagnosed with progressive forms of MS. But recent evidence shows that changes in cognition occur in people living with MS across all the stages of the disease, even its onset. Now, a lack of vitamin D has been associated with a higher risk of MS and a higher level of disease activity, and low levels of vitamin D have been associated with cognitive impairment in other neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. One of the first cognitive problems often seen in MS is a slowing in information processing speed, or the time needed to understand and respond to information. And there really haven't been studies that looked at the relationship between vitamin D and information processing speed in the early stages of MS. That is, until now. Researchers in Italy examined whether there was any correlation between vitamin D levels and information processing speed among 81 people who had been newly diagnosed with MS. These 81 study participants had their vitamin D levels measured at the time of their diagnosis, and their information processing speed was assessed as well. Low levels of vitamin D were measured in all but 10 of the 81 study participants, and those study participants with low vitamin D levels scored significantly lower on the information processing speed assessment. Compared with people who had vitamin D levels within the normal range, those people with low levels of vitamin D also had worse disease severity at the time of their diagnosis and again at a one-year follow-up. Now, statistical analysis showed that the most significant predictors of slower information processing speed were vitamin D levels, educational achievement, and age at the time of diagnosis. The research team noted that after they adjusted for EDSS, the type of MS, and MRI characteristics, vitamin D levels were the only predictor of information processing speeds. Now, previous clinical trials haven't shown that vitamin D supplements are an effective add-on therapy for people living with MS. But given the apparent impact of vitamin D levels on cognition, even in the very early stages of MS, well, it requires that more study needs to be focused on better understanding this. As there are several studies currently looking at vitamin D in MS, we'll keep you updated as other research results become available. And if you'd like to review this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Cognitive dysfunction is just one symptom of multiple sclerosis. But like other MS symptoms, it can get in the way of independently managing everyday tasks. That's when assistive technology can play a role in helping people maintain their independence and their quality of life. In a moment, we'll learn more about how assistive technology can be a real difference maker when we meet my guests, Alex Burnham and Bill Binko. Assistive technology can make independent living possible when it would otherwise feel overwhelming or at least difficult. Assistive technology can improve mobility, facilitate communication, and promote socialization. And joining me to talk about how assistive technology can be a difference maker for people living with MS are Alex Burnham and Bill Binko. Alex is a speech-language pathologist who's worked at the Boston Home providing care for residents and outpatients with advanced progressive neurological diseases, primarily MS, since 2009. Alex has served as Director of Rehabilitation Services since 2013, and he also oversees the Boston Home Institute for MS Education, Research, and Clinical Collaboration. 
Alex has been certified as a multiple sclerosis clinical specialist by the Consortium of MS Centers, and his areas of clinical interest include management of motor speech disorders and advanced MS, and the incorporation of assistive technology as communication resources for residents of the Boston home. And Bill Binko followed an unorthodox path to become an expert in assistive technology. After graduating from the University of Florida Computer Engineering Program, Bill spent 20 years in the technology industry working as a technical and business consultant. Ten years ago, he and his wife Lori founded LessonPix.com, an educational materials tool that's used by speech pathologists, special education teachers, and parents of children with special needs. This work introduced him to the AT industry. Bill founded ATMakers.org, a 50113 charity whose mission is to bridge the gap between the incredible abilities of those in the high-tech and maker communities with the profound needs of AT users. Today, AT Makers has teams of professional engineers, individual makers, and high school robotics teams throughout the U.S. and Canada designing and building custom advanced technology devices for end users at little or no cost. Alex Burnham and Bill Binko, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, John. Thank you for having us. Alex, I think a good place for us to start is having you explain what assistive technology is. Sure, John. So just to paraphrase the uh, official terminology from the Assistive Technology Act of 2004, assistive technology incorporates Uh, any item or product or system, which includes software that helps to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So it's a quite a big umbrella under which we include uh, various technologies that are maybe considered low tech, um, such as um, printed materials or visual aids, all the way up to high tech devices, such as um, speech generating devices, power mobility systems, and other ways that people can interact with their environment, both for um, home modification, uh, remote control, for vocational needs, for educational needs, and certainly for completing activities of daily living, even in the cases of people who have chronic progressive conditions such as MS. What are some everyday functions that can be enhanced by using assistive technology? Sure. Just about everything a person might want or need to do can be enhanced with some form of assistive technology. So many times we think of daily functions like bathing, dressing, eating. Those can be addressed with a number of different uh, products um, that are available for people to continue to maintain independence, maybe building up the handles on devices or um, using a special, uh, there's even a robotic Uh, feeding equipment now that can help people who are quadriplegic to eat independently. Uh, So there's quite a range of technology for different things like that. But in addition, uh, people have access to resources, usually in educational settings um, or through specialized uh, assistive technology programs at institutes of higher learning or in larger rehabilitation programs to be connected not only with the products, but the vendors and um, support staff that can help make the appropriate decision for what device or system or um, modifications to existing uh, products in the person's life that can make life more independent for them. When someone who's living with MS faces challenges with their motor function, restoring their mobility can have a significant impact on their quality of life. Alex, can you tell us what functional mobility is? What are some common MS symptoms that affect functional mobility? And then maybe share what some of the mobility devices that are available to offset some of those challenges. Yeah, definitely with mobility, people think of it as being up on two feet, but functional mobility is just how efficiently can somebody transport themselves. So for example, if people are having difficulty with balance, um, with motor control in the legs, Um, Maybe they're having uh, sensory symptoms that are causing them to feel like they're having burning or loss of sensation in the legs. Those can all interfere with a person's ability to walk as they once did. Um, So people may have access to devices like canes, crutches, uh, rolling walkers that can assist with the process of ambulation. 
However, for some people, as their symptoms progress in any of those areas due to MS, it actually may be more functionally mobile for them to consider using a manual wheelchair, a scooter, or a power wheelchair because it will give them a lot more mileage that they can cover um, than they would be able to on their two feet, as well as to be able to give them um, more energy to do other things and not be focusing solely on the task of um, walking with great effort. Are there devices or modifications that can help compensate for visual impairment? There are a number of systems in place, and we work very closely with uh, people who work with individuals with low vision or with um, the blind community, because many times they have unbelievable tricks. And again, it can be very high-end expensive equipment, or it can be very simple modifications. One great example that we used to hear about are people folding their bills in certain patterns. So they knew what's a 20, what's a 10, what's a five when they were out shopping. So um, I've learned so much from that community. And for many people with MS, they may have transient symptoms um, or they may have very different disorders of vision, depending on what's been affected by the disease. So they may be able to use existing visual enhancements that are on devices such as computers, smartphones, and tablets that enlarge text, um, invert color schemes, um, perhaps even just let the person zoom in on certain sections of the screen at a time um, because people aren't necessarily having the same exact visual disturbances um, with MS. So they may need to use one or a combination of options Um, to really help them out. But you can also use screen readers that will read the text out loud for you. You can do optical scanners that can take text and convert it to something that is spoken or um, enhanced magnification with a a pot magnifier or a a tabletop reader. You know, I think you started to answer my next question. I was thinking that, (laughs) sorry, no, no, that that's not a bad (laughs) thing at all. Um, I'm thinking that using a personal computer, tablet, or even a phone to access the internet can help mitigate the feelings of isolation that can accompany MS. But using those tools requires not only reliable vision, but hand-eye coordination, and the ability to simply type the right keys on a keyboard. Well, MS can make all of these simple tasks much more difficult and sometimes impossible. Is there assistive technology that can overcome some of these potential barriers to being connected with the world? Absolutely. And as you mentioned, most of us um, have access to at least one form of mainstream technology that can be adapted um, to really make it a great form of AT, Uh, not only for connecting with family and friends, but especially as we've all learned um, during the recent pandemic is that being able to connect via telehealth with um, your specialists has become a lifeline for many people who are living in the community or maybe have limited access to um, daily caregiver hours. So um, being able to use something like speech recognition technology to operate a computer or a tablet, um, being able to build in reminders for when to take medication or when to um, prepare for an upcoming appointment can be really critical for people to be engaged with their technology and not feel quite as isolated as they might otherwise be due to their situation or their mobility impairments. You know, someone listening to our conversation may be thinking to themselves, well, this sounds really great, but they don't necessarily know who or where or how to take that next step. Which specialist or or, or which professional would ideally help someone either with an assessment or help them create some sort of an individualized plan to move forward? And that's a really great question because it's not always something that is brought up in conversation with a person's neurologist or or primary care physician, but it it never hurts to ask, especially if a person is going to an MS specialist um, with their aware of resources in their local area that can provide assistive technology assessment um, and training options. Uh, You can also check with the National MS Society's MS Navigator Program. They have um, a wealth of knowledge about local programs that can be available for assistive technology assessment um, for trials. Um, And every state uh, by law has an assistive technology program. 
that can provide lending services where people can um, try out a device before they buy it, um, as well as connect them with, even more importantly than the actual device, uh, real live humans that can provide the appropriate assessment and modifications that might be appropriate for that person. So um, it's sometimes take a little bit of digging um, to make those connections, especially for those who live in more rural areas. But um, there, there are resources out there for people with MS who are looking to get into assistive technology. Well, assistive technology can certainly be transformational in making everyday activities easier and safer for people with disabilities. But first, it has to be available and affordable. Maybe that's where AT Makers comes in. Bill, can you tell us what AT Makers is and what motivated you to create AT Makers? Well, well, John, certainly that is a, a big part of it. And, and, um, and by the way, everything Alex just said, I'm 100% on board with. It is certainly true that there are uh, places that you can start. He had mentioned the state, uh, the state uh, organizations. There's actually a good place to find those. The ATAPorg.org is the Ass- Assistive Technology Association organization. They'll tell you where it is in your state. It's a good place to, to start. When I started getting involved in AT, I realized that, yeah, a lot of it isn't accessible. A lot of it isn't affordable. Uh, and I got really upset about it. I'm an engineer by training. A lot of the things out there seemed ridiculously priced uh, and difficult to get through. The hoops were awfully difficult to jump through. Um, and I tried to figure out why that was. And there's not a really, there's not a good villain in the story. It would be easier if there was, we could just go and slay him. Um, but re- realistically, the system is definitely um, kind of rigged to keep things difficult. And yeah, AT Makers is really formed because with my background, both as an engineer and as a parent of a child with special needs who'd been the parent in the hospital hundreds of nights, these are not the people who need additional hurdles to jump through. Um, so I founded AT Makers uh, five or six years ago, and it it is, the goal of it isn't let's make free AT. The goal of this is to bridge the gap between the AT community and the technology community. And we start that with the youngest among them. Right. So we start that with the high school kids. Can you give us an example of one of the projects that AT Makers has tackled? Absolutely. Um, Well, starting with the the high school kids, they've done um, all kinds of projects. They've adapted simple projects like uh, we had an Eagle Scout who went into a home and did nothing that wasn't off the shelf. So he put in a Nest thermostat, he put in hue bulbs, he installed Alexas in every room. And probably the most important was he put in a garage door opener that was internet connected. And none of that is traditional AT, and I don't think any of it can get funded. I'm not sure, but it would be very difficult to get any of it funded. Um, but that effort gave the person who lived there the ability to turn on their lights, change the temperature, and not give out keys to their caregivers because they could now open the garage door and let people in without having to give away keys. Uh, so, and that was just a high school kid that did it. We did, um, we, we've done all kinds of projects. We have one right now going on where we have a gentleman who can only move two fingers who wants to continue sailing. And he's got a rig right now that lets him sail with a motorized setup, but he, he has progressed to the point where he can no longer use it. And we're working uh, to, to go ahead and uh, expand what he's got, add to what he's got to be able to, to adapt it to his next step. Um, we've got program, we have kids or adults all over the country. So we've got them in California, Indiana, um, Georgia, Florida, Canada, Vancouver, and Toronto. They're all over the country. um, And we can find, there are robotics teams everywhere. So we can find you one near you. And they all need, you know, they all need outreach programs. Uh, We help them hit the the extrinsic rewards we get, like the chairman's awards. So they like working with us. Um, And it really has been a good partnership. We've done a ton with them. Well, beyond personal computers, tablets, and phones, there's a lot of research being focused on wearable technologies like fitness bands and smartwatches. Bill, what can you tell us about this new area of research, and how might these wearable devices be helpful to someone living with MS? Well, there's a lot. There, there's a lot of different types, right? So you've got your Fitbits and your your i your Apple watches. Um, some of them can be used to notify when somebody is within a particular range called uh, geofencing. So if somebody um, is within a specific area, 
You could have their lights turn on. Uh, so, so it's just a way of kind of tagging you, as awful as that sounds. It's really handy sometimes. Uh, and then the one of the big things about the Apple Watch is that it is open in that if you have an app in the Apple Store for a phone, um, you can extend extend that out to the to the watch. And a lot of times that just gives it something that's available and there. So um, you can put something on a watch that lets you control your environment without having to reinvent that that wheel. Let's shift our gaze from the present to the near-term future of assistive technology. As Wi-Fi becomes ubiquitous and homes may have multiple smart devices connected to the internet, Bill, what sort of assistive technology options will be available for people living with MS? Well, I think the biggest thing that you're going to see uh, hopefully, let me, let me put a big hopefully in front of this. Right? So I'm certain that over the next 10 years, the number of people using assistive technology is going to balloon. And that's because people are surviving a, a lot of different, not, not just MS, but tons of different um, diseases and situations are now survivable when they weren't. So you end up with people who um, may not have survived muscular dystrophy um, 10 years ago, but now will. And they're going to now need the, these tools to be able to access their environment and, and control their world. So that is growing fast enough that I think you're going to see an integration with the more traditional technology companies accelerate. We're already seeing that. So Google and Microsoft are adding things in like Microsoft has the uh, Xbox adaptive controller uh, and other things in the works. Uh, Logitech put out AT um, tools. So you're going to see more players with more technical uh, skills getting involved in this space, which will be interesting. I think that um, it, as, far as, as far as we're concerned, we are going to be working on more, uh, more, tech, more custom assistive technology. So we're working with Georgia Tech, um, their uh, Center for um, Inclusive Design, uh, to be able to train engineers that, you know, you're going to need to be able to design tools and devices to support people with um, different bodies, right? Whether that's from birth or, or through degeneration, we need to be able to, to look at a person, determine their abilities, and then create a custom device that, that actually does what they need. We're doing a lot of this. And so I think that that's going to expand beyond, uh, right now it's makers making change and, and AT makers and a few others, but that, that ability hopefully will expand to the general engineering populace and then also to the occupational therapist and, and ATP programs as well. Alex Burnham and Bill Binko, thank you for all that each of you do to improve the quality of life for people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. Great to be here. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 223. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. If you haven't yet done so, please don't forget to visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It is the easiest way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. So I hope you'll take a moment and download the app today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.